This is the Spiral Foundation. Welcome to our PowerPoint presentation, Introduction to Sensory Integration, written and narrated by Kristen Salmon, OTS, edited by Dr. Teresa May Benson, SCD, OTRL, FAOTA, on March 22, 2012. This presentation is brought to you by the Spiral Foundation under a Creative Commons license. This means that you may copy and distribute this presentation as long as you retain it in its original format with the Spiral Foundation credited as the author and owner of the work. You may not edit it, change it, or make derivative works of it. You may use it only for non-commercial purposes. That means you can share it with your friends, family, or colleagues, but you may not charge for it or make any money off of it. This presentation was funded by the generosity of the John W. Alden Trust and the Maxwell Hurston Charitable Foundation. Please enjoy our presentation. The following presentation is designed to define what sensory processing is, what sensory processing disorders are, as well as what children with sensory processing disorders look like. We will also present some strategies to address the difficulties resulting from sensory processing disorder. Before defining sensory processing disorder, it is important to know and understand what sensory processing is. Sensory processing is the organization of sensory in information in the nervous system. In addition to sensory processing, understanding the concept of sensory integration is also important. Sensory integration is the organization of sensations from one's body and the environment that makes it possible for the body to function effectively within the environment. Sensory processing and sensory process integration are important when considering one's ability to learn. Learning is dependent on our ability to take in and process information from the environment and from the movements of our bodies. Sensory integration was developed in the 1970s by A.G. Nares, an occupational therapist with advanced education in neuroscience and educational psychology. The theory looks at brain behavior relationships and specifies how sensory processing in the nervous system contributes to and impacts the development of behavior, skill, and learning. Sensory integration theory has three main components. How sensory integration facilitates normal development, identification and assessment of patterns of sensory dysfunction, and specific intervention techniques and equipment. Typical development of sensory integrative functioning starts with our senses. There are the five senses that are well known, touch, hearing, smell, taste, and vision. In addition to these five senses, we have two hidden senses, the proprioceptive system and the vestibular system. Proprioception is the sensory information in the muscles and joints, which provides input to our bodies regarding the speed, rate, sequencing, timing, and force of body movements. The vestibular system provides sensory input to the inner ear that tells us about head position and body movement against gravity. The vestibular system also contributes to our posture and ability to maintain a stable visual field. Development of body movements occur in infancy as the baby begins to interact with gravity. Movement against gravity allows development in important motor skills such as lifting their head, pulling into a sitting position, gaining postural control and balance, protective responses that automatically occur when we fall, and writing reactions which automatically occur when we lose our balance. In addition to interacting with gravity, interaction with sensory inputs such as touch and sound in the environment allows for development of grasping patterns needed for play and feeding, auditory development, and locomotive patterns. As the child continues to move in their environment, they develop important gross motor skills, such as walking on a line, throwing a ball, and eye-hand coordination. Fine motor skills, such as visual discrimination, drawing tasks, and development of mature grasping patterns needed for more function skills, such as holding a pencil, begin to develop. Increased confidence and mastery over their environment allows the child increased independence in completing self-care tasks such as dressing, feeding, and bathing. In school-age children, figure ground skills, body schema, and spatial awareness develop as sensory processing and motor skills mature. Figure ground skills allow us to separate an object from its surroundings, such as finding a pen in a drawer. 
Increased development of body schema allows a child to develop an internal sense of his or hers own body boundaries and body image. As a child experiences movement of the body through space, he or she develops spatial awareness. This awareness of body and space allows the child to understand where they are in relation to objects around them. When our bodies process sensory information effectively, we are able to find ways to self-regulate, which allows us to stay organized during structured and unstructured tasks. We are also able to adapt to changes in routines, attend to complete a task, and monitor our behavior within the context of a situation or environment effectively. Sensory processing also allows us to communicate efficiently. Sensory processing is important in the development of motor skills and our ability to interact in purposeful ways with the environment. Cognitive development, including creating a goal or plan, deciding on and executing a plan, and monitoring the effectiveness of the plan for adjustment are also impacted by one's ability to process sensory input effectively. There are many different reasons why normal development of sensory processing may be interrupted. Development may be interrupted by early pre- and postnatal experiences, prematurity or trauma at birth. Early childhood deprivation or abuse can also affect a child's ability to process sensory input. Changes in society, including people living more sedentary lives with the increase of technology and the change in playground equipment due to liability concerns around safety on equipment such as Zip lines and monkey bars may play a role in providing less opportunity for children to move their bodies in ways to promote typical development of sensory processing. When sensory integration does not occur properly, the child will present with a sensory processing disorder. Sensory processing disorder is an umbrella term that encompasses a number of disorders. Sensory modulation disorder or problems with self-regulation, sensory discrimination disorder or problems processing qualities of sensory inputs, postural and ocular disorders or difficulties with body control and control of eye movements, and praxis disorders or difficulty planning actions all fall under the umbrella of sensory processing disorder. Sensory modulation is our ability to regulate and organize behavioral reactions to sensory input in a way that allows us to function in our daily lives and complete needed tasks. Sensory modulation allows us to calm ourselves, respond to sensory stimulation appropriately, focus and attend to tasks, and work through challenging situations. Children who have difficulty with sensory modulation may avoid textures of clothing or have a preference for specific textures of clothing, such as soft materials. They may avoid contact with others, preferring to be at the end of the line at school, or avoid playing activities that involve touching others. They may have aggressive reactions to light touch or show signs of gravitational insecurity, which is an emotional reaction or fear of moving their head out of a vertical position. Also, children often do not like their nails cut or their face washed. Sensory discrimination allows us to identify the individual qualities of the sensory input we are receiving. This includes recognizing the size and shape of objects, the direction a sound is coming from, how our body moves, and where our bodies are in space. Discrimination of sensory information allows us to perform skilled activities involving coordination and motor planning. Different sensory systems allow us to distinguish where our body is and how our bodies need to move in order to complete a task. Tactile discrimination is the ability to register that input in your environment is touching you or that you are touching something. This is important for the development of body schema, fine motor skills, and motor planning. Visual discrimination is the ability to determine where something is and the position it is in. This allows us to determine the relation and qualities of objects in our environment. Visual discrimination is also important in the development of spatial and safety awareness and social interaction. Auditory discrimination allows us to recognize where sounds are coming from and what the sounds are that we are hearing. Auditory discrimination is also important for developing communication skills and allowing us to know where our body is in space. 
Proprioceptive discrimination gives input to our muscles and joints for them to recognize the need to contract and activate for action. This is important for our ability to judge positioning of joints, force needed for action, what position our body is in, and postural control. Vestibular discrimination allows us to know what position our head is in and that our head position has changed or needs to change. This is important for balance, movement through space, bilateral coordination, and eye-hand coordination. Children who have difficulty with sensory discrimination have difficulty with skilled activities. Poor vestibular discrimination may lead to difficulty recognizing the spatial orientation of their head and body. This can lead to them bumping their head when getting up or walking into things. They may also have difficulty knowing how much force to use to complete a task such as pushing too firmly or lightly with a pencil, showing poor discrimination of the proprioceptive system. Difficulty identifying where on their body they are being touched or difficulty distinguishing the difference between different textures can also be a result of poor tactile discrimination. Sensory discrimination skills result in difficulty planning actions for skilled activities, which is referred to as praxis. Praxis is defined as the ability of the brain to conceive of, organize, and carry out a sequence of unfamiliar actions. This includes the ability to generate ideas for action, organize and sequence the motor components of actions, and recognize feedback of actions. Praxis skills are important for one's ability to interact physically with the environment. There are different terms that are used to describe difficulties associated with praxis. Dyspraxia is a generic term referring to developmentally based motor planning disorders. Developmental coordination disorder is an impairment of motor coordination not caused by any other medical condition which interferes with one's academic performance or their ability to complete activities of daily living. Somatodyspraxia is a sensory integration based dyspraxia with evidence of tactile and proprioceptive based motor planning problems. Bilateral integration and sequencing is a sensory integration based dyspraxia with evidence of vestibular and proprioceptive based problems with sequencing actions and coordination of the part of the body. Difficulty with praxis functions can impact the child's ability to generate ideas and make choices such as what toy to play with and what to do with that toy once they have it. The child's ability to move their body in the environment, such as in, out, and around the objects and other people, may also be impacted. Transitioning from one activity to the next or tolerating changes in routines may be difficult. Playing independently or organizing one's self to complete activities, such as getting on and pumping a swing, can be challenging if the child is unaware how their body needs to move to complete a task. In early childhood, children with praxis problems may have difficulty with self-care, like blowing their nose or fastening buttons. They may also have difficulty with play activities, such as cutting, pasting, puzzles, coloring, or using playground equipment. There are often inconsistencies in child's performance as well. These inconsistencies in performance may be perceived as laziness or carelessness, when in fact it is a result of the effort required to consistently consciously complete actions that should be automatic. School-aged children with praxis problems may have difficulty with dressing and self-care, especially within time-restrictive schedules. At school, they may have difficulty with handwriting and art activities like pasting, cutting, coloring, and assembling class materials. On the playground, they may have difficulty with play skills such as bike riding, skipping rope, ball activities, and difficulty with organized sports and physical education class. Children may be described as being uncoordinated or clumsy. They may drop things frequently or bump into objects often. Interventions based on the sensory integration model provides activities that enhance sensation and promotes the ability to make adaptive responses to the environment. Educating the child and family about the child's body and how to have more successful interactions with the environment is important. The primary goal of sensory integration intervention is to improve one's ability to process information from the sensory systems that show dysfunction and to demonstrate better function through self-regulation and skill. 
There are different ways in which intervention services are provided. The first is direct service, which involves the therapist working directly with the child in a sensory-rich environment that allows the child to explore movement in a safe environment to increase function. The second type of service is consultation, which allows the therapist to give recommendations to the parents or the school for sensory strategies, such as a sensory diet, to help improve function. Sensory diet programs are based on the principle that individuals require certain quality of and quantity of sensory experiences to be skillful, adaptive, and organized in their daily lives. The sensory diet has four key components, regularly scheduled activities, sensory snacks, supportive routine leisure, and hideout time. Regularly scheduled activities are activities built into the child's routine to allow structured opportunities for movement throughout the day. Examples of regularly scheduled activities may include climbing a flight of stairs every 45 minutes. Routine supportive leisure activities are activities that the child may participate in once a week or sporadically. Examples include swimming, sports, or daily exercise. Sensory snacks are sensory tools for the child to use as needed throughout their day to help with self-regulation. Examples include chewing gum, fidget toys, or a tactile manipulative such as Velcro on the underside of a desk. Hideouts are quiet, small spaces for the child to retreat to and regroup when needed to help the child with self-regulation. Areas children may retreat to may include a clubhouse area in a bedroom, closet, or hiding under the table. Sensory diet programs may be used in conjunction with direct services to support function at home and at school, or may be used alone to support function in these settings. Sensory diet programs support improved self-regulation, increasing productive behaviors, or it may reduce sensory defensiveness in the immediate situation. It may also support improved postural functions while using accommodations and enhanced body schema. Sensory diet programs may support increased functional participation in play, self-care, and social interactions. Examples of different sensory tools that may be used as part of a child's sensory diet include oral motor activities such as string pipes, blowing through straws, blowing bubbles, gum, and chewing ice can be used for oral stimulation. Fidgets such as a stress ball or a wand with water and glitter in it can be used for visual distraction. Self-imposed input such as chair push-ups or weighted materials like a weighted vest or weighted blanket can be effective. Movement activities include using a therapy ball or cushion, jumping, pulling on a tubing, using swings, spinning boards, or the infinity walk. The infinity walk challenges the child to walk in a sideways eight or infinity pattern while keeping their eyes on a visual target. The complexity over the visual and motor challenges presented are increased over time. These challenges include adding a visual target for them to look at, such as playing hangman on a board or using flashcards for them to read as they walk the infinity pattern. This activity provides very organizing movement inputs, promotes postural control, and improves bilateral coordination skills. When creating a sensory diet, it is important to remember that it is an ongoing trial and error process. To create the most effective sensory diet for a child, you should keep a record of what sensory tools were used and for how long the child used them. What the outcome was after using the tool is also important and should be recorded along with an analysis of what tools have been most effective over time. Finally, activities that are incorporated into one's routine tend to be the most effective. Therefore, choosing activities that can be easily incorporated into the child's day is important. Here are a list of resources that may be useful in your exploration in gaining knowledge about sensory processing and sensory processing disorders. All books can be found through Amazon.com. The Out of Sync Child by C.S. Kranowitz, New York, The Berkeley Publishing Group, 1998. Sensory Integration and the Child by A. Jean Ayers, Los Angeles, Western Psychological Services, 2005. 
Living Sensationally, Understanding Your Senses by Winnie Dunn, Jessica Kingsley Publishing, 2009. The, the, the Sensational Kids, Hope and Help for Children with Sensory Processing by Lucy Miller, Putnam Adult, 2006. Making Sense of Sensory Integration by Jane Kumar, S. Sklute, and S. Cermak, Boulder Bell Curve Record, Incorporated, 2004 and www.sifocus.com. An audio version of this recording and additional audio and video downloads of other lectures are available at the Spiral Foundation website, www.thespiralfoundation.org. If you enjoy this recording and find it helpful, please consider visiting our website and making a donation. This will allow us to make additional materials available in the future. For more information, visit The Spiral Foundation, www.thespiralfoundation.org, or contact Teresa May Benson, SCD, OTRL, FAOTA, Director of Research and Education, or email info at thespiralfoundation.org.